Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. What is the mission of the church? Do you believe in the mission of the church? Are you going forth in your life with the mission of the church? Or in today's language, are you missional? Do you know what a missional church is without being a non-missional church? Thus is the language of all the Christian booksellers for the last couple decades. Of course, all this language comes out of a reality that the mainline denominations are dying, or at least we're told that. So we need to throw some last-ditch attempt to keep these dying institutions alive. This seems to be the only way to do it, the so-called missional way, the church growth way, the growing the church sort of thing. Now, all of that is complete confusion. It's not the way the church grows, as we saw on Pentecost. It's not the way the gospel is preached. And in point of fact, as history itself is already showing and has shown before, it doesn't work. The institutions are being ruined by our attempts to keep them alive because we fail to do the things that we're actually called to do, that is, preach the good news of Christ for forgiveness of sins. So to our text, remember that the 11 disciples have now been gathered in Galilee onto a mountain. Jesus had, as Matthew says, directed them. That is, he told them to go to this mountain. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. Ah, that's how we're going to fix the church, right? And there's a whole movement with an attempt to modernize worship, or rather you might just say electrify worship. And that's what we're trying to figure out. What is it that God has called us to do? What is, in particular, discipleship? And is that the solution to the decline of the church? But again, I'd suggest to you that we're looking at this all wrong. We know that the 11 disciples meeting in Galilee and on the top of the mountain, as everybody points out, expected something great. The mountain is always the place where something eventful is going to happen in the Bible in terms of an apocalypse, a revealing of God, like a burning bush or a transfiguration. Something like that's going to happen, surely, to which Jesus had directed them. That's why they worshipped him. But Jesus, on that day, does not respond with a miracle. He doesn't respond with tongues of fire coming down. Instead, he responds with a sermon. That means he's going to say something to them. His mouth is going to open. Words are going to come out, and he's going to have them hear. And so the first thing he says... All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When we think of authority in, on hev- in heaven and on earth, what we usually think of is two kingdoms, the civil estate or the earthly kingdom, and then the heavenly or the religious kingdom. But that's not what he's talking about here. Now the authority on he- in heaven and on earth is going to function a very different way. It's going to be a difference between the authority that frees you and the authority that commands you, imprisons you, or enslaves you. Both authorities he's giving to his disciples. And these two authorities are going to be used, and they're going to be be used in their own place and at the appropriate time. But only one of those authorities is going to last into eternity. You know those authorities? It's the office of the keys. The law gives the authority, gives its authority by threatening you with punishments and death. And the gospel is the authority that frees, forgives. So Jesus has just said, I'm going to use all authority here, and I'm going to use it in its proper way, to bind sins and to loose sins. That's Matthew's account of the office of the keys. We usually quote from John chapter 20. And then comes the famous Great Commission, even though that word doesn't appear here, and I'm not exactly sure who came up with that name. 
This is the last word from God in Christ to his disciples in Matthew's gospel. And God is now telling his disciples, this is what you go out and do. Notice the commission is given to his disciples. But we even get this all wrong. We think, ah, this is how we're supposed to start. To start out with the basics, you know, like the disciples, to preach and to teach, to absolve, to baptize, to administer the Lord's Supper. Those are like the floor, the foundation of the church. But, but it's really up to us to build a church upon that foundation. We need walls, we need a ceiling, lights, sound system, all that. And you can't rely on the word and the sacrament to do that. So you need to do something to make disciples over time. Start with the word, of course, and baptism even, but then it's on your time. What you're doing is building and building and building. That's what the Great Commission is all about, to go and to build on these building blocks. And that will finally mean then that you have created disciples of all nations. That is, the church will be big and not small, which is really what we want. But that's, again, a confusion of what the Great Commission is all about. And some of this comes because of the unfortunate way that English, the English Bibles have translated the Greek. The word here for disciple is not a noun. Go and make disciples. That's how it's translated as a noun. But it, it's actually a verb, discipling, or to disciple. So in, in English, it's been turned into a noun by putting make in front of it. So, make disciples. I'll spare you all the rest of the Greek grammar with participles and whatnot. You don't have to understand that. But it really should be translated as a verb, as in go, disciple. And if disciple is our verb, then how do we go, disciple people? Well, then he tells you, baptizing and teaching and going. Baptizing, teaching, and going is how disciples are made. Our typical missional theology, the answer to the de great decline of the church, is cuts off the, the rest of the phrase, all the bit about baptizing. And even gets the teaching part wrong too. And tries then to make disciples and establish what it means to be a disciple of Jesus without the baptism that Jesus gives. So they say, to be a disciple is just to be a follower, to know God's word. But that's not how Jesus defines it in our text. And the consequence has been deadly. The decline of the church is because we get Jesus' own command wrong. It's messed up what it means to be a disciple. It would be even better translated in this way, and I'll spare you the grammar, but continue to disciple. So it's something that's begun but has ongoing effect. We continue in the discipling that was handed over to those first apostles now in the apostolic church. We continue to disciple all nations. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's how you do it. That's how you make a disciple. Go on discipling, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, how hard is that? And yet, we all probably even know people, um, maybe even our own family, who have not received the gift of baptism, and yet we wonder why they aren't Christians. Hmm. And yes, it's true that Jesus adds in verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. But we get this wrong too. We think this is all about, well, they need to learn everything that the Bible says, or at least some bare minimum in our tradition, what the small catechism teaches. But that's, again, an unfortunate translation. It could be translated as teach um, or observe, but a better translation would be this. From the Greek toreo, it means to take charge of all that I have invested you with, or charged you with. To Say it again. To take charge, this is what he's telling his apostles, take charge of all that I've given you, invested you with, or charged you to do. So he's telling them to remember all of the institutions that he's already given to them. The supper, of course, baptism now, but also, as I mentioned, John 20, and the binding and loosing of sins. Remember those keys to release and bind sins that I gave you? That's how I made you a disciple. When I said to you, come, follow me, and forgave you. When I made you disciples, then I auth authorized you to use those same keys. And these keys are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. That makes you doorkeepers. 
When I am on my long journey, I want you now to be responsible for using it, to using these office the keys, to open the door of heaven that all may believe. So this office of the keys has been given to the church and normally exercised by the pastor. So when the pastor closes the door that has bind sins to those who don't desire to be forgiven, who don't believe, who doubt God's word, it's as if Jesus himself does it. Or when the door is opened for those who have heard the promise in faith, he's actually giving the promise. And how is the kingdom of heaven open once and for all? Not simply by a stone being rolled out from in front of it. How do you open up heaven for you? How do you become a good doorkeeper for Jesus, a slave to Jesus? How do we make disciples? Again, it's give the promise of baptism. It's in baptism. Again, not that complicated. But of course, that's our sinful nature, always trying to take the pure word of God and make it more difficult, more complicated. So what is baptism? Baptism is not just plain water, of course, but is the water used together with the Word of God. And which word is that? It's the word we heard today, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what a disciple is. That's what a disciple does. And that's what makes disciples, if you want to use that term. And discipling is doing exactly that. So what is baptism? It's the word put in water, and it's, but it's not water only. Which word? The word that gives you the name. And when you have the name, the name of the Trinity, and whenever you call upon that name, even on the final day, you will be saved. Baptism now saves you. Not maybe saved, not sort of, but entirely saved. What benefits do you get in baptism? God forgives sin. He delivers you from death and the devil, and he gives everything that he's promised. And what has he promised? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. And whoever is not, this is the binding key, whoever does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16. That's the life of the baptized. But how can this water, once administered, do such great things today and always? Well, baptism doesn't sort of save or start saving or maybe will save you if you follow it properly. It does save. It shall save you. Which means baptism is actually the daily life of the Christian. A disciple. To daily drown in baptism and to rise again in new life in Christ. Baptism drowns your life with daily repentance and day after day a new self will arise to live with God in righteousness and purity forever. Because we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, Paul writes in Romans 6, because we were buried with him through baptism, into death, into his death, so that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. Walk. That's what disciples do, following after Jesus. A gift, again, of your baptism. And that's the only way it happens. It's the only way it can happen, because that's the way that Christ instituted it. None of the other things that supposedly go into making the church, or the church do that, or the church grow, including what discipling means, what discipleship means, or how you could go on having classes about discipleship, all of that. None of that's the point, because none of it's what Christ gave. No, he gave, Trinity gave the name, the name of God, the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he put that name upon you in your baptism. You get it there. And then baptism applies it to you personally by using the name. So in baptism, you get your name, Christian, and You get God's name. And when you call upon that name, when you daily die to sin and rise to new life in his name, you are his disciple and you are saved. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Stand to confess.